Hey y'all, welcome back for more Bio 12, or Bio 12, Bio 20, week 12. We're finishing up part one of Big Omics by looking at how we can visualize the data that we see. We should be able to describe and draw the process of electrophoresis. We're actually going to be doing that in the lab this week, so hopefully you watch this before Tuesday. Then you should also be able to listen and describe various methods of transmitting information about gene expression. The most basic of all the techniques that we have in molecular biology is gel electrophoresis. It's going to be used for everything. The basic idea, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, the molecule I care about, which is either going to be protein, DNA, or RNA, and I'm going to run it through a matrix. Matrix is a nice way of saying I'm going to run it through a maze. And the maze is going to be made out of either a sugar called agarose or a polymer called polyacrylamide. And the pattern turns to be that small pieces move faster than large pieces. So it's a way of separating out fragments by size. There's some other techniques and tricks that go into all this that we don't necessarily care about. But basically what we're going to do is separate everything out by size. How are we going to cause that separation? We're going to use an electric field to force things to move. What I'm going to do is if I look at DNA or RNA, it tends to be negatively charged. So what I can do is if I run it into an electric field, it's going to run to the positive, what we call anode, or not the anode, but the cathode of, actually no, positive is the anode. So the positive electrode inside of a chamber and that will force the DNA or the RNA, or if we do some manipulation, the protein to move. The catch is DNA, RNA, and protein, for the most part, we can't see. So we're going to have to stain it so that we can see the molecules. The lab that you're going to be dealing with this week, it's already been done. So all we have to do is then visualize it. So you're going to not want to touch things with your hands. This entire process is what we call gel electrophoresis. So again, we load up our sample on one end on the negative electrode side. We're going to zap it with electricity and it's going to move it being the DNA, RNA, or protein towards the positive electrode. And the pieces that are down on the bottom are gonna be smaller than the pieces up on top. And if I were to load in say, a whole bunch of information from the CODIS database, what I can end up doing is making a visualization much like that example I showed you, dealing with, you know, the families and then the three babies. I'll insert the video here. So that's going to tell us about the DNA. How can we visualize expression data? Well, it usually shows up in a few different types of graphs. And much like in the real world, how you choose to display your information tells you about what, you're, what message you're trying to convey. So what we try and do is actually make the data as accessible as possible, just in case normal non-science people see it. And... The problem is sometimes we want to say so much in it. So sometimes us trying to be as transparent as possible makes the data non-transparent or non-accessible, even though that's not the intention. But it's usually we're, we're trying a little too hard. And it's because we only have so many, so many pages and so much space. But the nice thing is there are visual tricks that we can look for. Even if you don't understand everything that you're staring at because it's so overwhelming, we can still pick up on tricks. There are three basic graphs that we can make. One of them is going to be a volcano plot. One of them is going to be a heat map. The other one's called a Manhattan plot. Here I see actually both a volcano plot and a heat map. These data here deal with breast cancer. And what we're looking at are the genetic markers that associate with breast cancer or not. This here on the left is what we would call a volcano plot. 
and the reason why it's called a volcano plot is it kind of looks like an erupting volcano. What we see here, each of these dots is an accumulation of data. So each one of these is going to be a gene where what we did was we compared the transcription in breast cancer versus transcription in non-breast cancer. And what I can do based upon that is I can compare by looking at breast cancer tissue versus non-breast cancer tissue. Some of these over here, them circling, these are going to be genes that are expressed more than normal. Meaning these ones are more expressed in breast cancer than in non-breast cancer. These ones here in salmon color, these are expressed less than normal. Meaning in breast cancer, these are not as expressed as they normally would be. And then we have this weirdo middle section where it doesn't seem to really matter. The way that these graphs or the axes, the horizontal axis is talking about how much more and how much less. So FC stands for fold change. So it's dealing with how many times more or how many times less compared to normal. The vertical axis is dealing with significance, so p-values, so statistics, where here what we see is the higher up it goes, the more significant the difference is. So these data here, okay, that's all nice, well, and convenient. I could sit there and I could start plucking out whatever these genes are and whatever these genes are. But is there a pattern? The heat map tells us the pattern. So what we see is up here a whole bunch of samples that came from individuals with breast cancer. And over here on the far right, these are going to be my controls. I know it's really hard to see, and that's because it's a massive amount of data. But what we can see is there's gradations of color. And you have areas where it's bright red and we have areas where it's yellow. It turns out the color tells you about how much gene expression is going on. So the color tells you about if transcription is up or down and its significance. It's kind of like if you were to look at an actual factual weather map like this, where we can look and say, oh, well, the redder it is, probably the hotter it's going to be or, you know, the more severe it's going to feel. And then the greener it is, the less severe, the less heat, whatever it's going to turn out to be. That's how we interpret pictures like this. Of note, this is actually a map of COVID-19 risk from July of 2020. But we interpret this as, oh... So clearly we have a whole bunch of genes over here that being that are highly expressed. And, oh, we have a whole bunch over here that are also highly expressed. And then we also have, you know, these ones down here that are highly expressed in breast cancer. And if you look over here on the left, these are the relationships between the genes. So we can actually start to pick out patterns in the genes and what are more expressed and less expressed as opposed to the volcano plot which is just let's show you which ones are up and which ones are down this one here is what we call a manhattan plot and it is associated there's an l right there with what's known as a gwas gwas is a genome wide association study This is when we look through the entire human genome, as flawed as it is, and we try and figure out, are there any patterns that match whatever the condition is? So we do GWAS for all sorts of things. There is one that just came out dealing with COVID-19 and your susceptibility for the long-term effects of COVID-19, so long COVID. There's some questions about the paper, but yeah, that, that's not for us. 
So this one here is actually from a study dealing with skin cancer. And are there genetic risk factors for skin cancer? What you happen to see here are all the SNPs in the human genome. At least all the ones that were noted and looked at. So there's a lot here. There's a lot of things that they looked at. This line here is what we would call the threshold. So this is the delineation between significant, not significant. And what we want to find is, is there a significant marker that correlates, meaning it seems to follow along with skin cancer? Anything that goes above the line, that's a SNP and thus a gene that we might want to look at. And if you look, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10... There were 10 of these areas that were kind of, hmm, this is a little suspect. Maybe they might be worth looking into a little bit more. They even noted them by two different things. So if the color turns out to be black, that is a gene associated with pigments. For those of you who have you know, gotten sunburns before, you are aware that you get a sunburn, but then you get tan afterwards, and then it eventually goes away. Well, why do you get tan? Because your body's fighting back against the sunburn. Because clearly, you roasted yourself in the sun that one time, so we need to put more pigment into your skin so that you don't burn. The problem is, you're telling these cells to work overtime, and making them work overtime because they were damaged tends to result in cancer. So that's why seeking tans is not necessarily a good battle plan, for ye of, you know, milk complexity. The red ones turn out to be genes or SNPs associated with genes that then associate with skin cancer, but they don't seem to have anything to do with actual skin coloration. In lab this week, we're dealing with DNA fingerprinting. It's going to be a lab that it takes a while, so we have to get it started. We can talk, then we check on it again. So we are going to have to start it right away. It is also, if it's done right, it is a very pretty lab. You all are going to be like, oh, did I do that? And you're going to want to take pictures with it. I'm just telling you right now. And yes, you may take photos with it, but you have to do it right. And it's very much a lab of skill. So if you're not like working the pieces of equipment correctly, you're going to screw it up. So you don't, you want to read up before class. Hopefully, again, you see this before you show up to class. Where we're going next is we're going to take all this genetic stuff and all this genomic stuff, but we're going to start combining it with all the metabolism and the cells and the energy and all that stuff and start asking questions about the diversity of life and where did all this stuff come from? And why are there so many patterns? And do those patterns mean anything? That's where we're going next.